Hi, and welcome to another edition of Let's Get Down to Business. We are commemorating the 21st anniversary of the Eastern Caribbean Securities Market. And on this edition of the program, I have a distinguished panel who are going to tell us a lot more about the Eastern Caribbean Securities Market and what it means to be 21 years old. So let me welcome Mr. Mr. Trevor Blake, who is the Managing Director of the East Caribbean, East Caribbean Securities Exchange. I'll also welcome Mr. Lucia Fissal, who is the CEO of the Eastern Caribbean Securities Regulatory Commission. Let me welcome two brokers in the, this whole operation. Mrs. Alana Joseph from the Grenada Cooperative Bank Limited. She is the Executive Manager Wealth Management and Financial Services, and Mrs. Norlin Gabriel Boy, and she is the head of regional operations for First Citizens Investment. Welcome, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Thank you. Good. Thank you. So let's 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 kick off. We're talking about the Eastern Caribbean securities market. So I want to go straight to Trevor and ask him to explain to the viewers. What is the Eastern Caribbean securities market? All right. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Tony. Um, the Eastern Caribbean securities market is a regional market that was created in 20, 2001 uh, to provide a marketplace where securities could be bought and sold across the Eastern Caribbean seamlessly. Uh, it is a regional market. Uh, governed on the regional body of legislation and regulated by the Eastern Caribbean Securities Regula Regulatory Committee. But um, Gail will speak a bit about that. Ms. Fizal will speak a bit about, a bit about that. Um, the market is a, a marketplace, as I said, for the buying and selling of financial assets. And uh, the things that are uh, uh, traded on the market would be securities, um, stocks and bonds, debt instruments, um, the government bonds, corporate bonds, corporate people. Of course, when we say stocks, uh, we, we are talking about shares, equities, uh, shares in, in public companies. Um, so those are the things that are traded in the market. The market uh, is basically structured around a number of key, key um, institutions. The Eastern Caribbean Securities Exchange, which I have the pleasure of heading, um, the Eastern Caribbean Securities Central Securities Depository. Uh, we have as well the the, the regulator, which it sits at the apex, the Eastern Caribbean Securities Regulatory Commission, and then we have the intermediaries, uh, the broker dealers, which Norlin and Alana represent. So before we, we we talk to the brokers, I want to get a bit more of, of a sense of the need for regulation and the role there of um, the regulatory commission so maybe alusia can come in here and give me some clarity on that yes thank you thank you tony um the eastern caribbean securities regulatory commission was established in 2001 at the start of the market um at the time the the um governments decided or agreed to come together and establish this um the the commission the role of the commission really is to promote uh, the, 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 the activity on the market by ensuring that whatever persons who are involved in the, the, in the market are adequately qualified and are licensed to operate. So we license broker dealers and investment advisors, and we also license the Eastern Caribbean Securities Exchange as the securities exchange for, for the Eastern Caribbean securities market. The role of regulation really is to ensure that there's fairness in the activities that are undertaken in the market so that persons can feel confident when they invest that their investments are being, well, the activities or the, the, the business on the market is being conducted in a fair, efficient and sound manner. And you mentioned the word fair. So how much is an investor protected by law? I mean, because I don't know where regulations 
overlap legislation. Um, so, right. so how much? And is yeah. because we're part of the currency union. Um, I'm assuming any legislation you talk about is harmonized um, across the region. So maybe maybe yeah. just explain a bit more about that. Um, right. Right. So the, the market, as uh, Mr. Blake would have indicated, is governed by um, uniform or harmonized legislation, which is enacted or has been enacted in each of the member countries. So each parliament in each of the member countries would have enacted the, the um, Securities Act and the regulations supporting the Securities Act. Within the Securities Act, there are provisions that gives the Commission enforcement powers. So, for example, if... Um, there is an actor or someone is is conducting securities business that is that has not been authorized under the act the commission has the authority to step in and um perhaps issue for example a cease and desist order to have that person um, comply with the, the the regulations or the legislation and the law there are also provisions that would give um, investors recourse if they feel that um, they have um if they have sustain any loss losses they they are um provisions in the securities act that would would um you know provide some level of recourse for investors so in other words we can't have any shoddy or shady companies trading on the stock market and think that they can get away with it like some fantastic pyramid scheme yes that's uh, correct that's correct <laughs> i want to talk to the brokers a bit about um actual market trading um how does one trade on the market maybe i, I could start with um alana and then nolan you can you can come in okay um well it's, it's pretty simple to start trading on the market um the role of the broker well the broker acts as the intermediary um in the operations on the eastern caribbean securities market so any investor interested in trading on the market must do so through a licensed broker, a licensed broker, or um, yeah, a licensed broker. Um, as I said, it's pretty simple and straightforward. Um, you first establish a relationship with a licensed broker, um, and that really entails a customer due diligence process. What broker, of course, confirms and verifies the identity of the investor. Um, and then you, of course, have a conversation in terms of the broker gets a, a chance to understand the investment goals and objectives of the investor. Um, of course, having a conversation about risk and risk management. And then we take it from there in terms of looking at what are the opportunities on the market that would meet your needs. Um, and when those opportunities arise, the timing and uh, um, in capitalizing on those opportunities. So, so Nolan um you're from first citizens um and and so first citizens like the grenada cooperative bank is a registered broker with the with the market um do you actively advertise you know the equities that are you know tradable or as an investor must i come to you and um seek that sort of advice knowledge how how how, how does it work um, we do have our regulator on the panel, and that's wonderful for this question that you have asked, Tony, um, because securities trading is, is not a broad-based um, type of approach because it tends to be uh, more sophisticated, and our market regulation has to ensure that clients are understanding exactly what they're engaging in. So as far as advertising, any advertisements that are done in the region has to be um, vetted by our regulator before they're rolled out to the marketplace. Now, when Alana um, gave her response to your earlier question, she talks about the um, risk tolerance, um, establishing the risk tolerance of that investor. Because um, investment is, is very unique, it's not a one size fits all. A key component of the broker client relationship is understanding the risk appetites of that client and ensuring that you're only marketing and, and those products that match that client's risk appetite. So it really is more of a consultative process uh, versus a very broad based, hey, we are offering shares at this time. 
Having said that, um, we do have a database of existing investors as well as investors who have indicated that they would like to invest in the future. And from that, we would actually reach out to them and have discussions about upcoming issues. And, and Nolan and um, Alana, and, and I suppose uh, the, the people who are with the, with the exchange, um, are there threshold amounts? Um, in, in other words, could I come in and buy one share of a company? <laughs> you know, that's that's trading at nine dollars. Um, surely that won't make sense. So, so who sets those limits? The upper and lower limits. Who, who sets them? I don't know if this is a question for the brokers or for. Or, or Trevor? Um, I think we can take it as the broker. Um, they're an issue and the, the limits or what, what do we call it? Allocation limits or buckets for any specific issue is going to be um, basically set by the issuer at the time that that issue is done. So, so for example, if it's a primary market issue where it's the first time coming to market, um, it may be stated in the prospectus, which is the governing document for any of the issues that are coming to market, indicating that there are minimum quantities of X. Um, I really have not seen maximum quantities. The only time I can think of where I see necessarily there's a, a max set on a quantity is if there's a cap in terms of the class of investor that can invest. And by that, I mean, if you have an issue that's coming to market and it is allocated, say, 20 percent to the um, let's take the BOSVG um, example that happened in St. Vincent, you know, 20 percent for the NIS, X amount to the public. So, of course, you're going to be capped by those um, those categories within the, the quantities allocated to those categories. Right. But in terms of a capping by the individual investor, if there's nothing else specific um, that's stated, um, there is no necessarily, there's not necessarily a max. So is it the case that competitive laws may be, so if, if the region was governed by a competitive commission, um, that maybe that's a sort of overlap um, that may exist if there was no if there was no limit necessarily set by the issuer, right? Um, should Tony Redstone be able to buy ninety five percent of um, of a particular company that is trading, which then gives me a de facto monopoly in the market in which I exist? So I, I guess that's not your um, <laughs> your 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 business. I mean, it's it's a competitive um, or competition. Commission. Correct. And there is a timing issue. So as broker dealers, um, we are required and we are bound by the rules and regulations of the market. And um, a big part of that is, is, is time date stamping of orders received. And so really it is up to um, the investors and when their orders are, are received and an order is considered received and completed when all documentation, clients onboarding, KYC, all clients onboarding forms are completed, all IDs, all due diligence checks are done, but also when an order form as well as payment is received. <laughs> If I may add to to uh, to sure, what sure. Nolan has said, sure. um, the the uh, sometimes uh, restrictions on the the maximum that any any investor could could subscribe in a in a primary issue. So, for example, if if with an IPO or an a, a listing of a of of a of a, a new security, um, the the within the the prospectus or the offer documents, there could be a limitation placed. Uh, to prevent any one person from from becoming uh, a, a large investor who would have control over the entity, we also have some some um, listings in in regulated areas. For example, some industries like banking, uh, one can, one or, or a group of connected parties can own more than say five percent of the the equity in that company, and there are restrictions in the market. To allow for those things to happen, the, the, in terms of um, uh, limits or the minimum amount you could buy on the secondary market, one could come in and buy as little as 20, 20 uh, 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 shares in a company. 
what is the secondary so, market? Because so, so we have to establish that. So there's primary, um, there's the primary market and the secondary market. So maybe it's a good um, juncture at which you can explain what both of those are, primary sure. and secondary market. Sure. The primary market is where a security is being brought to the market for the first time. So an issue, um, whether it be a corporate issue or a government issue, uh, seeks to raise some money and brings uh, securities to sell on the market to gain the, 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 the capital that's contributed from the sale of those, those securities. So uh, an issue, a company, a, a government uh, seeking to raise capital, sell securities in the primary market to gain the, the, the resources from that sale. And that would be a, a primary issuance. In the secondary market, we are, we are talking here of securities that are already listed, securities that are already held by, by, um, by existing investors, and they're traded between, between the, those investors. So and in the, the market facilitates that, that particular um, type of trading. Absolutely. The market right. uh, that's you know we are, we are, we most of the 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 the, the activity in the corporate um, well in the equities would happen in the in the secondary market where we have companies that are already in existence and probably have been in existence for years that are listed on the market and we call those seasoned issues um, those uh, those companies may not be seeking to raise additional capital but they are they are listed. To enable their their shareholders to buy to sell their their, their securities and other other um, investors are able to buy in that secondary market. Alana, I have a question for you. The, the, you're a broker, so you've sold me um, some you know equity in in a, in a particular company or concern that's trading on the market, and I now have these. Can I use um, that as collateral anyway? um any well we have to remember that the securities you purchase on the market are technically assets right and of course um these assets can be used as collateral for various arrangements and especially with financial institutions not only can they be used as assets but the proceeds from the investments so for instance your dividends in some instances um, from your equities, or even if you're talking about fixed income um, securities, such as your debt instruments, your bonds and treasury bills and so forth, the returns that you get, the interest payments can also go towards your loan payments. Of course, that depends on your arrangements, terms and conditions with your financial institutions. But um, because the, so to answer your question, yes, the instruments traded on the markets can be used as collateral um, for debt and other arrangements, debt facilities and other arrangements. Here's another question I have about, uh, it comes about from something that you said in terms of gains or proceeds. Um, so capital gains, which is what I'm hoping for when I, when I make an investment, um, the tax on capital gains, is that something that's harmonized in the region or that varies from country to country capital gains tax um the the short answer to that is it's harmonized uh because in every country the governments have have agreed that for securities issued and listed on the ecse there'll be no tax on the gains uh from from those investments so there's no capital gains tax, there's no income tax on the dividends or the interest on those, on those securities. So this is a measure, I suppose, to stimulate or incentivize people for using the market. Absolutely. Um, right. So having said all of that, let's talk about how active the securities market is. Uh, um, Yes, Sorry. go ahead. You wanted to say something. You, to say um, something I know mm -hmm. you had asked a question about the minimum, you know, to start. And I didn't want to omit the fact that the securities on the regional government securities market, generally the minimum starts at $5,000. And I mean, I know you said if somebody wants to buy one share, if that makes sense, um, but there are shares on the market as low as a dollar and 30 cents, a dollar and 25 cents. So the I wouldn't 
call it barriers to entry because there are really no barriers. You know, they, it's the market is quite open for anybody to really participate. You know, so I just wanted to make that point. And one other thing, I think when you asked about the role of the broker, I mentioned the investor side, um, and I didn't mention the issuer side. So as a broker, we also represent the persons issuing securities on the market. Um, so we would, of course, um, help them in structuring their arrangements, their offers on the market, the marketing side of it, bringing it to market, getting the traction in the market and an interest in the market as well. So we perform dual roles in terms of the investor side as well as the issuer side. How busy is the market, um, Trevor? How, yeah, um, you know, we're, we're talking about something that um, may very well be niche. And, and sure. you know, sure. um, and I'm sure the, the brokers on, on the discussion want to see maybe a lot more activity. Um, <laughs> we, or, we all or, do. Or, or is there yes. too much? <laughs> we, no, no, no. We all do. Um, in terms of, and we could, we could, we could look at it in, 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 from both sides of the market, on the primary market and then on the secondary market. Um, on the primary markets, we're pretty, very active. Um, every, every so often governments, and we have some five governments that are actively issuing securities on the RGSM. So the, the primary markets are quite busy every, a few times a month, there are auctions of securities. So that, that, is, that is good. We, we, we are happy with the, of course, we could always, it could always be improved, but we are pretty happy with the primary market. Before you, before you continue, Keep, uh -huh. your, keep your thoughts, because sure. we are using the term RGSM, which is the Regional Securities Government Market. And I suppose we need to explain to the viewers that you are divided um, for a platform um, mm -hmm. for trailing government paper, if, if you want to call it that, and one for um, corporate entities. So maybe you just, just, just explain that a little bit, and then you can continue with your the point sure. you're making. Sure. On the ECS, we host two different two different uh, markets: uh, the regional government securities market, which is a, gov a market for governments to raise capital um, uh, across the region. So, in that market, only governments participate in the market as issuers. So, they issue securities, whether it be treasury bills, bonds, treasury notes. They issue securities on a regular basis on the regional government securities market. So that is a market for government securities. Then we have the Eastern Caribbean securities market, which is the market for the primary issue of corporate securities. Those would be um, uh, securities issued by, by companies and not by governments. And it is the secondary market for all of the securities that are traded in, in, on, on the exchange. So, so uh, for example, a government might issue a bond on the regional government securities market and then they list it on the ECSM or the Eastern Caribbean Securities Market, which is then traded between um, uh, individuals, etc. So that is the distinction between the two. So I, I understand that. So back to your point about the activity that you want to see increased. Um, the I, I, right. I didn't ask specifically how many companies are trading, but maybe you'd choose to give me a sort of idea. Sure. As to sure. What's your okay. volume? What's your size? Uh, yes. Not in monetary terms, but in um, terms of companies trading. Sure. Um, so we have we have just to say about the, the list on the listing board. We have we have about 160 securities listed. Uh, the majority of that represents government debt securities, and um, those tend not to be traded very often. So um, typ typically, the the investors would buy them and and essentially hold them to maturity. Uh, so those, ha well, there's some trading, but it's not significant. Then, then we have some corporate debt securities. Um, our major issue in that area is the Eastern Cap is ECHMB Capital, and they they issue a number of of corporate people instruments, and and those again are not traded very very often. The the their buyers tend to hold them to maturity. Then we have uh, 14 equities listed. That is 14 companies from across the currency union listed. Um, the, 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 again, our, our culture is one of a buy and hold 
uh, strategy where persons buy those securities and hold them for either for the capital gains, the dividend to pass them on to their 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 grandchildren, etc. But these again are not traded very actively. So our secondary market trading is 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 quite low. Uh, we of course would want to see that improve. We want to see people uh, uh, seeing the the their shares as a commodity to be bought and sold, and not necessarily as a a part of a company. I mean, you are invested when you invest in shares in the capital of a company. You become a part owner of the company. But right. we need to make that shift to see that not as a share in a company, but a commodity that you should be right. So you, you, I, I guess the word is speculating. Is that the right term? You want to see people speculate more with what they, um, what they hold as equity. Uh, speculating or, has a has a particular connotation okay. that I, okay. I, I would want to uh, so, so, encourage. Uh, so, so correct uh, me. Highly risky. Yeah. Correct me. Okay. What what? I invite you now to tell me what is speculation and what is the term used for for. Um, the right. buying and selling. Right. The buying and selling is actively trading. So that's actively trading. <laughs> actively <Okay>. trading. As <laughs> well. uh, uh, in markets, there's some degree of speculation yes. uh, because you 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 are buy a security because you think that security may, may increase in value, and then you buy it, you hold it till you see the increase that you were looking for, and then you sell uh, to to unlock the value. That you would have, you you would have. That would have. Trevor, been let me industry. ask the brokers here on this mm -hmm. point. Let me ask the brokers here that uh, uh, on the um, discussion. Is speculation not a good thing for you um, as brokers, or, or is it just a highly risky, volatile uh, activity that um, you discourage? I I, I want to get an understanding from your perspective. I think the way I would look at this, Tony, I would go back to um, risk appetite and the risk appetite of any individual investor. So an investor who does not have the risk tolerance for very risky assets, investing in risky assets, we can consider that speculative. I think our responsibility as brokers is to ensure that we are matching the instruments and the level of risk that those instruments carry with the type of investor. And the type of in investor will be determined by that investor's goals. It may be their age, their comfort level. What does their portfolio size look like? What their timeline for creation of wealth looks like? Um, so I, I actually don't like the term speculation um, because it, it it almost feels like uh, an element of gambling and investing for some people it can be but it it really should not be it should be looked at as a mechanism for the creation of wealth oh, right, right. I, I understand that fully i understand that fully um the companies that are listed um and so we're talking about corporates now we're not talking about governments I went up on your your um, website and mm -hmm. I, you know, did some research and it seemed like to me that the share values um, of most of them uh, uh, over a period of time, constant, um, not shifting at all. What is that an indication of, basically? How does that tell me what's happening in the market? Yeah, it, it, that, that reflects the, the low level of activity. A share price would move uh, unless there's a, a trading it. Um, so the, the price the price is uh, determined by what what uh, how how much people want the shares basically well, the yeah, demand for them he, hmm. the demand the effective demand for it. So hmm. what a a third party who investor would buy would pay for the shares. So um, the a totally independent person looking at all of the, the fundamentals, decide that share is worth to them and that is what they would pay for it. Um, because the, sh the share price is determined from the, the interaction of buyers and sellers. When there's a, a trade executed, somebody is willing to, to pay X for the, sh the share and somebody else is willing to sell it for, for X. And that is how the price is determined. And so, so when you see... Oh, sorry, yes, okay. Go ahead, Alusia. Go ahead, Alusia. 
<laughs> well, Mr. Mick was finishing his point. I let him finish his. Yeah, I was, as I was saying, so when you see that the share prices are moving, it, it's an indication that there, there are very low, low, low levels of trades in those securities. That doesn't mean that the, the, the security may not be, may, uh, value may not be increasing. It's just mm -hmm. that nobody has translated that into a price change on the market by, by trading at those, those high levels. And a big part of that is our culture. Um, and the culture in, in, in our market is one, as Mr. Blake indicated earlier, where folks buy and hold. So the, the, the level of trading activity is not there. I mean, there, the things that affect the price of the stock will range from the level of earnings in that company. And as he indicated, a company may be profitable and growing their earnings um, and is, is, is a very you know, valuable um, stock from that perspective. But the fact that it's not trading does not mean that um, no one wants it. It just may mean that for the shares that are there within the market, no one is willing to sell. Because for the, somebody has to meet the demand and the supply side. And, and that's what we see in our market. So it's a bit sticky and on, on, on the equity side. Anna Lucy, you're going to say? Yes. I was just going to add as well that, um, you know, securities markets operate on information. And as Nolan would have indicated, you know, if you, you, you as an investor, you would want to know how well your company, the company that you've invested in is doing. And that is where the, the regulator comes in to make sure that issuers, those companies that have issued shares to the public that are listed on the, the ECSM, provide periodic information to the investors. So for example, there are requirements for issuers to submit um, to their shareholders, their annual reports, their audited financial statements, and um, this, this information also has to be presented to the commission. So in an ideal world, what would happen is that you would have, you know, information being fed to the market from these companies, and that sort of information would be used by investors and their brokers to assess a stock to determine, you know, should I keep this? Should I sell? Should I, you know, that is how uh, the, the markets, the international markets operate. And this is where we want to get to um, our market to in the 21st from after this, you know, going forward in, 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 in our, 20, our 21st anniversary. So we want to get, get our market to that level where persons um, have information and they use that information and it's useful to them to make decisions that would um, promote that sort of activity that we want to see happening on the market. And just to, to add a plug, um, the commission, the information that is submitted to the commission is um, by the issuers is uploaded to a website, uh, www.ecsin.com and information on all the companies, for example, changes in management, changes in auditors, uh, their financial statements. Um, the listed companies are required to submit quarterly um, accounts and, and reports as well. These are can be viewed and are obtainable on or accessible via the Eastern Caribbean Securities Information Network, which is a website that is included as part of the Eastern Caribbean Securities Regulatory Commission website. So just to tie everything in, I think that is one of the main reasons why you're seeing the inactivity on the market, because there's a general lack of understanding um, by investors or even the general population, the public, that they can um, buy and trade. You know, they just don't have to hold, there is an intrinsic value to the asset that they can discover, um, you know, as an investor. So I think that also contributes to um, the inactivity we are seeing in the market. Let's look at the element of risk and who as an investor, um, well, from the investor's perspective, where does he or she get that guidance from, apart from the broker who will show the risk profile of of the investment that they're making, but there's an independent, is there an independent um, risk rating entity that um, will, um, for example, on, on, on government bonds and government paper, um, you may have a Moody in, in some jurisdictions. What, what exists here? 
So in the region, we have an organization called CARICRIS. And CARICRIS is a credit rating agency. And the objective is to actually assess um, th that entity's credit worthiness relative to other issuing entities. So there is a regional scale, which is comparative across the region. And then there is a national scale as well. So CARICRIS does exist in the region and it's based in Trinidad. So how do I find the information that they put out there? So Caricris um, lists the information very similarly to Moody's and Standard & Poor's. One of the things to note is that it is an option of the issuer <laughs> to actually go through a rating process because a rating process um, implies continuous assessment and review as with the larger um, rating agencies. And in addition to that, the entity has to also agree to release that rating. And once that rating is released, you can find that online. Now it benefits um, entities, um, issuers, to have themselves assessed and rated because then that rating factors into investors' um, risk approval process for the approval um, for investment into their securities. So there is a framework and there is a quite a great framework within the OECS, um, a framework that's transparent, that's, uh, that's governed very well, that's highly efficient. Um, it does exist. I just think that we, we really just have to look at the ways and the means to get that information more out into the general public, not just to investors, but also to issuers, because it is also a very efficient way for issuers to raise capital. Uh, I'm just going to say, Carrie Chris, Carrie Chris uh, actually uh, publishes the, uh, the, 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 um, the ratings uh, for those... At, I should say they are public ratings and they are private ratings. Yes. Some private ratings, those would not be published, but um, and an issue could determine whether their rating would be private or public. But for the public ratings, the Caricus issues a press release on on those ratings, and we would we would we would post those ratings on our website for the for the for the entities that are listed on the ECSE. So any ratings that by any of the the, the entities that are listed on the ECSE. Once it is published, we would post it on our website. Okay, that's 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 interesting to me in terms of the the the, uh, the risk management side of things from the investors' um, perspective. How does an issuer enter the market? They, they're not listed. How do you become listed? How I let's say I have. Uh, uh, a corporate entity and i i want to i want to raise some funds i don't want to go to the bank to raise that capital i want to raise it through the stock market what is the process they, they go to a, they go to a, a broker dealer so i don't know the broker dealer <laughs> so there, there are tiers um for different types of issuers um and and the market has established tiers for those issuers um there are entry level equity tiers for equity issuers. And as Trevor would have indicated earlier, we, we do need to make the distinction between the type of issue that, that is on the market. The, the issues that are on our market are debt and equity. Whereas the debt equities, uh, debt um, instruments, my bad, I'm sorry, are more like a, a, a loan type um, arrangement, whereas equity, you're, you're actually gaining ownership in a company. Um, so there is an entry level tier for equity securities. And um, as he indicated earlier on the regional government securities market, those are mainly debt instruments. So the regional government market is generally a debt instrument market. So we're now shifting to where we're looking at how does a company raise financing to start up um, if they would, or if they're looking to expand, what can they do in terms of raising debt or equity? So there are tiers um, for issuers um, um, from, my understanding, I think you have to at least be a going concern for the minimum tier for at least 18 months. Is that correct, Trevor? That, that, that's correct. I, 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 why, why I deferred to you, I thought you I could go to the actual process <laughs> <laughs> of, of a company comes to you and say, well, look, I want to... Yeah, so, you, have, so you, you, you do have to start with um, which tier that, that that client may fit into. 
Uh, and so there are established tiers um, for different categories of um, investor of, of issuers, sizes, um, aging, capitalization. Um, and based on that, the those issues can then start going through the process that's established for listing. What um, has been happening in our market, because as a broker, we have been receiving quite a bit of um, inquiries from startup type organizations. And I was extremely heartened to see that our, our regulator has taken the bold step forward to actually start consultation and, and looking at a framework to provide some level of crowdfunding or venture capital type of, um, of, of raising for those startup type entities. So um, there are ways to raise um, money in the market. Um, you would come to a broker and you would sit in consultation with that broker. It is important for companies, particularly if you're going to... Um, eventually raise funds in the market to maintain adequate and proper financial records. I think that is something that can be a challenge a lot of times um, because once you are listed, there are requirements for continuous reporting and that's how the market is protected and that's how we keep the market efficient, the efficiency of the release of that information. So everyone is making a decision based on shared information, um, which is the goal of the market, the marketplace. I want to get the concept of debt and equity um, fully, you know, explained um, for for our viewers. Now, as my understanding is, um, somebody comes to the market looking to raise funds, not to sell shares, but to raise funds. They're looking for a loan primarily um they're not they haven't gone to the bank but they've come to people who are willing to go to the stock market and buy their debt instrument mm -hmm. is that what it is so therefore yes. if it is that those must be fixed terms um because it has to mature at some stage when when do i get paid back um right and how is that set how, how are the, these terms set um who sets the interest that I make? Obviously, I'm not just going to throw money out and not get back the interest. Is it the issuer that makes a promise to pay a particular yes. rate of interest? Uh, and does the regulator now ensure that that happens? Um, explain all of that process to me before we get to the equity part. Yes, with, with, with debt, uh, the, the issuer comes to the market to raise capital through a debt issue like a bond or or some other type of paper. It could be a note, a shorter term note, etc. Uh, the issuer must must uh, produce a prospectus, publish the prospectus, in which it sets out the terms of the offer, including the 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 tenor of the instrument, uh, whether it's going to be a five year, ten year, even twenty year bond, uh, the interest rate. Uh, whatever that it may choose to offer and and in 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 determining the offer uh it would look at the market conditions and see what would be a rate that the public would would want to to uh, to accept for for that debt given its risk profile etc and it it de determines uh the well the, it's the the prospectus would also set out the frequency with which the um the, the interest will be paid and whether or not the the payment on uh, on maturity of the or the payment will be on maturity of the instrument in which what would be the sort of bullet payment or whether it will be repaid over time in an amortization um, so a, a, a bond could be amortized over a particular schedule so um, maybe every every six months you get a portion of the principal being being redeemed and repaid to you. So the prospectus will set out all of that. Important thing with that, um, the, it's certain it's the certainty one uh, that you will always get the interest, provided of course the business doesn't go bust. Uh, so the, you have certainty in terms of the cash flows from the from that investment. It will always be paid on the, on that on that schedule. And you will you will you will get your 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 funds returned to you your principal that you have invested returned to you in full at the end of the the period whether it's a in the case of a bullet uh, instrument 
or over time in the case of an amortization. Um, and and on the equity side, which is, um, I think Northern Northern was saying, this is where um, somebody's actually selling shares. So there's no maturity here. If I want to dispose of my equity, I have to sell um, at my own in in my own time. Um, yes. And I get dividends um, based on the company's performance, I suppose. Um, right. So. Right. So is it the broker that's keeping me abreast with with all of this? Um, how how do I know what my dividends are likely to be in 2023? You ask if it's the role of the broker, but as an investor, you also have a role. You, the investor has a role to monitor the performance of the investment. Remember, it's an asset. It's money that you put out. It's not leave it and forget it. So you also have a role to monitor um, fundamental and technical technical information of the company, meaning looking at trends, pre, um, previous performance, looking at future expectations, looking at the economy, looking at those things to come up with what you what you anticipate a uh, dividend may be, whether they may be or not. But remember, you're not when you make an investment in equity, you're not just looking at a dividend to make a decision as to whether to buy and hold. You're also looking at the value of the assets whether there have been capital gains, whether you anticipate future capital gains as well. So your decision to buy or sell should not be based only on the dividend or the return um, that you're actually getting on the assets. I, I, I think I'd like to add that their dividend policies are normally set by a company. So um, a dividend in, 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 in essence is a, a payout of a certain percentage of profit. Um, at the end of a year or whatever that designation designated period may be. So uh, a company may indicate that they may pay out 40% of their um, dividends, um, of their profits as dividends at the end of their financial year. So those guidelines are normally set by the company um, who you are invested in. And just to add um, from the regulator's point of view, uh, Mr. Blake would have mentioned so, uh, the prospectus. So under the securities laws, every company, if a company wants to offer securities to the public, they would have to prepare a prospectus. And there are guidelines in the regulations as to what information that should be included in, in that prospectus. And um, one of the, the, the elements or the components um, that needs to be included, as Nolan would have indicated, is a dividend policy. So as part of the prospectus, um, you put in, you would need to, the issuer would need to include the terms of the, the, the offer, um, whether there's an, a minimum amount, the, uh, a minimum or maximum amount that they're looking for. Um, there's also, as Mr. Blake indicated, the, the interest, how it's going to be paid, what your return is like. And there's also information, general information on the issuer. So the company background, um, you have information on the directors, the managers, uh, what are their qualifications. Um, we also have included information on whether there are any legal matters facing the company that may be, you know, a risk. We also have um, included there information on the risk of the investment. So the, the, the investor or the, the prospective investor is encouraged to look at those, um, at, at the prospectus with their broker or their investment advisor when they decide to, to make um, a, 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 an investment. And most, most importantly, that document is reviewed by the regulator and um, the requirements under the law is that we approve that, that document. And then there's the issue of information, which goes back to what I was saying earlier um, in terms of as your role as, as, as a shareholder is to not just go to meetings and vote on issues. That's very good. Yes, you should be part of participating in that, in that way. But you also have a responsibility to monitor the operations of that company to see you know, what, what uh, management team changes are happening, whether the company decides to change its name, change its business strategy. These are things that you should be aware of. And the information on, on, on that is available, will be or should be available on the ECSRC's website, www.ecsin.com. 
um, because those companies that are listed and have issued shares um, or debt to the public are required to provide that um, periodic information to, to, to investors and the general public. So it seems to me, and we're starting to wind down on our time here, but it seems to me that um, after 21 years, which is um, the anniversary that you are celebrating, you've got quite a solid structure in place um, to provide the sort of platform that's required for such a market to operate. You've got excellent relationships with brokers represented here by two exemplary ones. Um, you have all of that, but on the activity side, given what one may proffer the market to be a serious engine of economic growth and wealth creation in the currency union, um, how do we how do we get this market to the securities market to really max out on its potential to do to do that to to increase wealth to um, drive economic growth? Yes, that's a very important question and uh, one you know which with which we are all you know engaged. Uh, that is the crux, really. Uh, we aim to be the, you know, uh, a, method, a mechanism for wealth creation. So, uh, how do we actually achieve that? Well, firstly, we have to get more people participating. So, we need to get more, more investors uh, coming into the market and seeking to benefit from the, from investing on the market. I mean, we want to do that in a number of ways. We want to expand the range of product that we have on the market. Uh, we want to um, to reach more people, and and programs such as these are important in, in doing that, in spreading the word, in raising the awareness. And we are trying to do m m much more of that. Um, we are trying to reach people through v different media as well. Uh, we are now engaged in social media, so so to, to get more and more more persons, especially the younger the younger persons involved in the market and knowing of the market, seeking to benefit from the market. We need to get more more product, as I said. So we are we are again reaching out to more more companies that that exist in our region to get them to 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 list on the market. Because the more product you have, the 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 the, 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 the more more uh, chance of more activity happening. If one of the problems we have with, with with people trading what they already hold, if you if you have a security and you you sell it, I mean. You want to be able to reinvest that money in another security so that you could so we need to expand the the, the range of product on, on the market um we we need to look at new 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 technology um, and we are now engaged with a, a fintech firm in out of canada to create a digital asset trading platform in in the region so again that is that is reaching that is producing another opportunity for persons who may be caught up in, in the whole blockchain technology to benefit from that in an organized and, and regulated manner. We are, we are looking at our diaspora in the, you know, in, you know, the, the anecdotally there are more, more persons living in the, the North American and, 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 and British cap, uh, cities than they are within our, 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 um, our region. So we are looking at to see how we could we could reach the diaspora in a way to get them to, to give them the information on the on the markets and get them involved in, in marketing. We need to also expand our our broker dealer network. We have of course uh, Nolan and Alana here, and we have uh, four other broker dealers. But we don't have a broker dealer in every country, so we need to we need to get get that going as well. We need to have new other other forms of of of. Um, of intermediaries, investment advisors, and things like that, who are able to encourage and 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 uh, work with individuals to get them to get them to to enter so, the market. So, Trevor, in, in the interest of time, I mean, you've you've identified in that um, that um, mode for quite a lot of um, things that need to be put in place, implemented, massaged um, to get this thing really going and i'm assuming here that there are plans afoot to tackle everything that you've identified and over a, a you know a, a very workable and aggressive period of time but Nolan, 
and I think Alana did mention something earlier on about the culture of yes. the people as well. Yes. That, that, that has yes. to be a big factor. What are we doing about that? Quickly, in, in, in one minute. Um, that's a big hurdle, Tony. And that's the, that's the mountain we have to climb for us to start seeing more growth and, and for us to see the market actually being efficient in driving growth. The mechanism is absolutely in place. But the culture of, of, of family-owned businesses in our, um, in our region and the hesitancy um, to actually open that up to ownership um, by individuals is something that we have to continue to address by continuing to educate the market. I, I think the only way that we are going to change that mindset is to actually deepen the investment savvy of the market by continued education, continued outreach, continued preaching what the benefits are um, versus because the, the one thing that a lot of individuals will tell you when you speak to them about issuing is that this closure that's supposed to benefit all investors is an uncomfortable thing for some um, <laughs> for some issuers or for some businesses. And it's not that there's anything nefarious per se going on. It's just that we are we are used to holding that information to our chest. And that is a hurdle that we can only overcome with education and continued education. Yeah. And but well, even on the investor side as well. So Nolan covered like on the issuer side, people listing their businesses for investment. Um, but even on the investor side, the, there is a, a lack of education, even from institutional um, organizations from the school level, for instance. Even um, young adults does not; they don't understand. We don't understand. That was never part of our cultural upbringing. The value of investments and wealth creation, and our people are now at a phase where we can afford to, because of the foundations laid by our parents and those gone before us, that they have made it easier for us to move into wealth creation. And I don't think the population, the investing public, has really embraced that as yet. We still stick to the safe banking see banking as the only alternative, but we see that the banking landscape is also changing and becoming more competitive. And really and truly, um, there is need to pursue other avenues to, to grow your wealth, you know, and have your money work for you after you work hard for it. Yeah. And yeah. can I just say one thing from the regulator side, because we do have a role to play as well in this. Um, we are responsible for market development to some extent. And, and so we are now looking at you know, implementing or changing some of the, the um, policies and, and procedures that we have had in place for a long time that has not really worked too well for us. So we have looked, we are looking at those and uh, making changes when necessary. Um, one of the most recent changes that we did was to reduce the capital requirement for license for in, uh, to become a, a broker dealer. So we've re reduced that under the new securities. We've drafted a new securities law. And um, the whole aim is to promote and get more uh, different types of, of intermediaries involved in the market. And I can say as well that we have a lot of interest from licensees who want to offer additional products on the market. We're now looking at at least three companies that are looking at offering mutual funds. So there, there is a lot being done. And we're hoping that, you know, from very soon, we will see a, a lot more diversification on the market. And of course, um, you know, more persons, you know, getting involved and, and becoming interested. On the education side, I do agree as well that there's a lot of work that needs to be done there. And we are also involved there as well. I want to thank you all for um, spending this um, time with the viewers, your 21st anniversary. Um, I'm addressing the people here um, representing the market and your brokers who are here with you. Um, I hope we can have follow-up programs. And um, this, I hope, has been informative and can help the people in the currency union to best understand how you offer an alternative for creating wealth. This has been another edition of Let's Get Down to Business. My guests were Mrs. Alana Joseph from the Grenada Cooperative Bank Limited. She's the Executive Manager of Wealth Management and Financial Services. Mrs. Norlan Gabriel Boy, who is the Head of Regional Operations, First Citizens Investment. Ms. Alusia Fisal, the CEO of the 
Eastern Caribbean Securities Regulatory Commission and Mr. Trevor Blake, the Managing Director of the Eastern Caribbean Securities Exchange. Thank you for viewing.